Okay. Well, it's officially six o'clock, so I can, I'll keep adding people as they come in, but uh, Dean, if you would like to take it away from here, we can do that. All right. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, be speaking to the Airmen's Association again, and uh, I thought uh, for sure by the uh, response last year, I, I tried to speak for about five or six hours, so I thought for sure that uh, I would bore everybody to death and they wouldn't ask me to do it again, but I guess uh, I guess they were sucker for punishment, so I'm back. So, but, uh, Victoria said, my name is Dean Paulson, and I'm a uh, local CFI. I specialize in uh, floats, tailwheels, skis, tundra tires, off-airport operations, and, and uh, just uh, had a uh, uh, quite a uh, long experience in Alaska. This is my uh, 35th year of flying floats in Alaska, and, and uh, people are always amazed to hear that, and uh, they're amazed to hear that someone would let a two-year-old fly an airplane because I'm only, only 37, but uh, but uh, I'm a little late to this uh, the Zoom thing. This is my first ever Zoom, so uh, if we have any technical glitches or anything, it's probably on me because I have uh, never done this before, but, but uh, as a uh, Retired school teacher, I should have figured this out because, man, if I could have done this for the last 30 years, I, I probably wouldn't own shoes or socks. So, so this is a uh, pleasure to be uh, speaking to everybody uh, this way, but look forward to uh, getting back to one-on-one uh, -on -one and being able to see everybody in person again. So I um, thought we'd just uh, talk about a few of the uh, discussion items that people brought to me last time. And, um, and again, I, at the end, I hope there's a time for some forum and discussion. And, and if not, um, I'm easy to reach, and so I, I'd love to answer questions for anybody anytime. But as a, a float plane instructor, um, my my goal, my uh, my absolute passion in in uh, in my uh, career as an instructor is making um, you guys safe, legal, and uh, successful seaplane pilots, so that you can go out and have lots and lots of fun with these airplanes and and stay safe and stay legal. And uh, and it's been. Uh, a pretty good looking summer so far. I've been uh, pleased to see the the uh, number of accidents and the number of fatalities. Uh, it, uh, it's uh, encouraging this year. Something something is going very right this year. There's a lot of aviation going on still. We uh, we have a lot of general aviation pilots and the uh, and the training community is very, very strong. I uh, have been doing a lot of flying. I could fly nine days a week, 26 hours a day if I wanted to right now. Uh, there's a an awful lot of, uh, of uh, instruction demand right now so so that's encouraging uh, I know the uh, airlines and the uh, and the uh, the 135 businesses are are hurting right now so I would encourage you guys to uh, tell your relatives tell your friends to get out and, and really uh, patronize those businesses and, and if the uh, out-of-state tourists aren't coming let's let's uh, some of us uh, locals get out there and fly with with our uh, our wonderful part 135 carriers and and uh, and really take advantage of that so um, we've got a little bit of technical glitch, so when I say uh, uh, change, uh, Victoria is going to change the slide for me. So I will, uh, I will just uh, uh, just start with that. Um, the the other thing I would like to just uh, make a disclaimer of is this: this is a discussion and not intended for instruction. And, and uh, in this uh, litigious society, I, a person always has to be aware of the fact that everything you say on online, especially, is the gospel. And uh, and remember that this is uh, is. Uh, Few of the items that I've pulled out, ab absolutely not a comprehensive look at uh, seaplane flying or all the ins and outs. That would take weeks, months, years, and a lifetime to uh, to teach. So, so um, I would just like to uh, start off the discussions with some of the major points. So, Victoria, give me the first slide, please. One of the big items in uh, flying float planes is uh, being able to read the uh, wind from different sources and being able to utilize that to the to our means. Uh, the nice thing about flying floats is we often have the advantage of being able to land and take off into the wind and we're able to avoid you know in some cases downwind landings and in and a lot of cases crosswind landings but that's not always the case. Um, quite often is the case where uh, river landings for example will will have a need for a for an upriver landing with a downriver takeoff, and that's a a very common practice with a lot of carriers. If uh, if you work up at uh, Lake Creek, for example, you'll notice just about all the operators are are using that scenario because it's a uh, it's conducive to a smooth flow in and out of those areas. But um, as I said before, you know, ideally it would be nice if we could always land and take off into the wind. And 
And uh, being able to read the wind is uh, is a, a very important skill set for a float plane pilot. So as you see the um, the uh, little FAA um, um, uh, dialog box here, it just shows what are these different um, um, types of scenarios that we have when we uh, um, one second. Hey, Mindy, yep. could you please get the dog? There you go. Um, when we have um, anything from calm to uh, to very, very strong winds. And so, uh, um, you know, when we first start flying floats, you would think that, you know, the nicest scenario you could possibly have would be an absolutely windless situation. But but as anyone who's spent time in a float plane and dealt with glassy waters uh, knows very well that, that, that uh, calm water and glassy water is a is an extreme uh, um, uh, challenge and, and needs to be approached with a with a good training scenario that is is well practiced and, and uh, not a good time to uh, just pull it out of the hat when you uh, when you just uh, when you uh, come to the uh, to the situation. So um, with your when you get out and do some training, when you get out with your instructors, when you get on practice on your own, you know, go back to those um, to those early lessons where you learned how to establish that that um, um, skill set for the uh, glassy water and we'll come back to that in just a moment but but as you can see in the chart right here we go from a uh, from calm all the way to moderate gale and i've always told my students that if uh, if we could work in the uh, in the third column there the light breeze i really don't think anyone would really need a float plane rating or even much float plane instruction because the uh, the uh, uh, aircraft is very, very easy to control when we have a, a light ripple on the water and when we have a light breeze like that. And, and that's associated with on the water, you know, just small wavelets and, uh, and a uh, very, very gentle wind. If you uh, were to be standing on the shore, it would be barely rustling the leaves, but, en but enough to rough up the surface of the water. And, um, and, uh, so unfortunately that's rarely the case one of one of the most common scenarios that that i will uh, encounter is i'll leave lake hood in glassy water and come back in in white caps and and um the last operator i worked for was down in very end of spinard and so quite often i'd have to do a pretty good uh, crosswind landing in the channel and uh, stay on step and get down into the shelter of spinard before i could come off step and and get into the shelter of the trees back there <clears throat> and so uh so as you uh, as you start to um, start to uh, fly and explore and get into these bigger bigger and bigger winds and and uh, different different elements, it's uh, it's important that you uh, that you know the uh, the um, uh, the characteristics of the water, how it's going to behave, and and how your aircraft's going to behave to it also. And and it's very very important to uh, to only go into uh, situations that you are well practiced for. Um, it's not a good time to. Uh, to try to make it up at the uh, at the last moment. So, um, the, uh, the big question comes up. A lot of students ask, "How big a wave can you land in?" And and if you start reading Jay Fry's book and you start reading some of the seaplane documents, you'll see that that people tell you you can land in waves that are, are up to one third the length of your floats, and and that's that's getting pretty big. I mean, when you're on an eighteen foot float, you're talking about a six foot wave, and and I've landed in six foot waves, and and that's a uh, that's a real eye opener. And so it's a uh, it's a scary thing, but um, but it is something that you uh, again need to be well practiced for. It's not a not a good idea to go jump into those monster waves like that, and and uh, and it's a uh, a real eye opener as to how much energy is is transmitted right up those those um, float fittings right into your spine and right into the fuselage. It's a it's a lot of a lot of energy that uh, goes from that water into your airplane. So be careful with that big water, and if you can avoid it, avoid yeah. it. So. You can you can often avoid those big waves by by getting to the other shore and, and trying to uh, to land closer to the uh, to the other shore where the waves are not so big. So, all right. Um, next uh, slide, please. The other one that comes up often, obviously, is uh, determining water depth, and uh, and that's something that can uh, that can be either a, uh, a mild inconvenience or an extreme danger. I mean, we can we can get an airplane good and stuck or we can uh, we can put one upside down and, and so it's uh, it's very important that we learn how to uh, estimate the uh, the depth of water and um, um, at, at the end of this discussion I know that uh, that people will have a lot to say about uh, about that subject really the the greatest way to uh, to know the water depth is to 
actually know the water depth. I mean, if you're operating out of a lake that you know very well and, uh, and uh, have spent time in for a number of years, maybe fished, maybe, uh, maybe done like this guy and been out uh, diving or swimming in it, then uh, that's one of the best ways that we can really, uh, really know for sure how deep water is. Um, beyond that, watercolor is a, is a big thing. You know, we look at that dark blue water and we usually feel pretty secure in knowing that that water is, is, uh, is fairly deep. Uh, we talked about this in length last year too, uh, about the different sea life that, that grows out there. So when we see those, those uh, lilies with the yellow flowers on them, those usually like three to six feet of water. And so those are a, a good safe depth of water for every seaplane that we're operating. And, um, and when we see some of that um, funny little, I, I like to call it bamboo grass. I'm sure there's a Latin name for it, but it's a, a funny little sprig of gat grass that looks like a, um, almost like asparagus. That stuff tends to grow in about four to six inches of water. So you're going to start to get into some, uh, some uh, uh, awfully shallow water when you start to see that. Um, it often grows close to shoals and close to the shore, obviously, and, and will uh, we'll come out, out of old, uh, old sunken uh, beaver lodges and that sort of thing. Uh, the color of the water, I don't know if uh, if you guys can see this or not, but I was flying two nights ago, and uh, or just last night actually, and just, uh, I don't know if you can see that, but not the highest tech way of showing it. But another uh, another obvious thing is that that real limey green water that we see, we're often getting into water that's uh, less than a foot thick when we see, uh, less than a foot deep when we see that. And so that's a, uh, uh, one to really take caution in and, and, and avoid with your heavier aircraft. You might be able to fly in there with a, a cub or, or something light, but, but sticking a 206 or a beaver in there obviously can, can get you into a really uh, serious situation and, and uh, usually end up in a, in a call to the helicopter or something that's going to get you out of that stuff. Um, some of the tricky areas that I've found in water depth in the state are, uh, are the uh, Brooks Lake and the uh, um, all the areas affected by the 1912 Katmai eruption. That, uh, that 1912 eruption threw pumice all over the, uh, the entire, uh, buried the, the, the land of 10,000 smokes, at the Valley of 10,000 smokes, and, and those lakes down in the Katmai area there. And so you can, uh, you can get into some really unexpected scenarios when you're flying down in Katmai. Um, I, I landed at Kukaklik Lake one time at the uh, bottom of uh, Moraine Creek. And I remember uh, um, someone told me before I landed there, make sure you land a long ways out from shore. And, and I, would, I would recommend you land a half, half mile out from shore. And I, I thought that was really kind of some overly cautious uh, advice there. But, but I did what he said. And, uh, and when I started taxiing for shore, I started touching bottom uh, very, very soon thereafter. And we ended up parking the airplane and, and anchoring it about um, probably a good 200 yards from shore. I was really astonished and how shallow that water was up to the, uh, up to the mouth of Moraine Creek. And, and so, um, so local knowledge like that is something that's extremely important. You know, talk to the, talk to the locals, talk to pilots. <clears throat> and, um, you know, we, we, unfortunately, we kind of separate ourselves a little bit in the general aviation uh, industry, and we don't, we don't talk a lot to the, uh, the carriers that, that are working for, uh, for the part 135 businesses, but these are, these are some wonderful pilots that are extremely helpful and, uh, and they will, they will give you advice all day long. I mean, when, when you get in the air and you start hearing them chattering back and forth, these are, these are competitors that are telling each other if the pass is open and if conditions are right for flight and, and all that competition goes out the window when, when people start uh, getting in the air and it's a, it's a true brother and sisterhood out there when, when people start talking. I, uh, I really appreciate that. I, I would be in flying last last year. I would have been in, you know, pretty much harm's way a lot a lot more often had I not been able to talk to the different pilots that were out there, especially with all that smoke last summer. And um, flying 135 last summer was a real challenge. It was it would have been this, this summer. I'm, I'm not flying 135. I'm just instructing, and it is it is very nice as an instructor to uh, to take the day off when when conditions get very poor and, and not have to go to minimums. So it's a uh, um, uh, something that, uh, is a, a real benefit from this side of the, uh, of the, uh, of the chair, but, um, uh, water depth, big one, you know, and again, discussion items, you guys have some great advice. I was even looking up some of the, uh, some of the, uh, hydrodynamic energy charts where they show you wave height 
and they have this mathematical formula for it way beyond my level of education. So I, uh, uh, for those of you who are, are being into the math and the, and the uh, engineering side, you, you probably get a kick out of checking out some of those things and being able to uh, determine water um, depths by a mathematical process. So, okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> Once again, that uh, shallow water is very often easy to see with, uh, with uh, the color change there. And um, you know, one thing that is uh, very big in uh, the sunglass world are polarized glasses. And uh, I was told a number of years ago, I believe it was Glenn Allsworth that told me that uh, polarized glasses are not a very good idea for, uh, for seaplane pilots because they uh, um, allow us to see through the surface of the water and can throw off our depth perception quite a bit. And so uh, um, that is something that uh, I had never thought about before, but, uh, but an interesting, uh, interesting note. So um, um, something to think about also. Next slide. The other uh, big element, obviously, with, uh, with float flying are, are the water hazards that we have. Um, we have you know, a number of unseen obstacles that we can, uh, we can get uh, uh, tangled up with. We have the, uh, the uh, danger of uh, uh, underwater obstacles like sunken logs, old beaver lodges, what rocks that are under the water, um, shoals that are rising up. And, uh, and that could be anything from, you know, being inconvenient to getting stuck to, uh, to getting upside down. And so that, that is obviously a, a, a huge element here. Um, as I start to evaluate water when I fly over, I look for a, a continuous wave pattern. So I'm looking for anything that's breaking those waves. So if, if you see a, uh, a lake full of waves and all of a sudden there's a, uh, a slick spot, then that is often indication that you've probably got a shoal or something that's rising up in, that, in the bottom of that lake that, uh, that needs to be addressed and something that you need to look at. So um, again, uh, I, I would, I've learned everything from, uh, from my students and from experience and from reading. And so, uh, again, discussion time. If you guys have more things to add, um, more ways to, uh, to avoid those things. I remember uh, Heidi Roos, who uh, gave me my, my commercial float rating more years ago than I care to tell. She uh, had a hard rule of staying one tree length away from shorelines when she was doing um, uh, taxi work. And, and if you know Heidi, she loves to do high-speed taxis and loves to drive around the perimeter of a lake on step. And so uh, she said a, a good safe thing for her was to stay one tree fall away from the shoreline, which would, uh, would keep her from, from uh, you know, logs that had, that had fallen in from, uh, from the uh, surrounding forest there. So next slide, please. <clears throat> That's the scary one right there. We, uh, you know, now what? I mean, there's a, uh, there's always the chance that something's going to go terribly wrong. And, and um, uh, from this standpoint, um, this is obviously a terrible scenario, but the, the worst case scenario comes from not briefing pilots, uh, I'm sorry, not briefing your passengers about the terrible danger of this, about what, what can happen to us if, uh, if this does happen, because, uh, you know, that's going to be a dark cockpit full of dirty water. And so it's very, very important that you really, really brief your passenger on how to egress that aircraft. And, and um, what I like to do is, is give a good pre-flight briefing and I tell my passengers to close their eyes and find the door handle <clears throat> and then tell me how many other ways they could get out of the airplane if they had to, even if I meant kicking out the, uh, the windows, getting their, pulling up their feet and kicking the windows out with their, uh, with their heels. I mean, uh, it's, it's no holds barred when it comes to uh, getting out of a, a sinking airplane and out of a uh, inverted airplane. So very important that that's something that you, um, that you uh, mentally practice for. Uh, last year's seminar, there were a couple members that uh, were discussing the uh, the dunk tank training that comes to Anchorage, and they said about every three four months there is a uh, there is a um, opportunity for uh, pilots to engage in the drunk uh, the dunk the drunk tank, the dunk tank uh, um, training, and where you are put into a fuselage and uh, dumped into a swimming pool, and it's a fairly sterile environment that we're prepared for and and uh, and yet people are quite amazed at how uh it is quite disconcerting to be thrown into a cage upside down and and they have no no oxygen there and so they have divers standing by and all the safety precautions but uh, my my son went through the alaska state trooper training and he they did that to him and he said it was uh it was a uh, an eye opener he said it is something that uh you uh, you need to be trained for because it is uh it is a frightening thing to be 
uh, strapped into a, uh, into a cage and then thrown into a water upside down. And so, um, <clears throat> people at 206, again, uh, you know, we've had a number of tragedies where people are in the very back seats of 206s and, and, uh, you know, our, our larger aircraft that are capable of holding a lot of people. I mean, it's, it's very important that every person in an aircraft knows how to get out of the airplane and then, uh, and then that they have access to, uh, flotation devices after they get out of the airplane. And, and if they're a, uh, a CO2 cylinder type uh, of uh, uh, PFD where you have to pop the, uh, the, the uh, CO2 and inflate your, uh, your vest, it's important that they know to not do that until they're clear of the aircraft because it is quite restricting. If you've ever inflated one of those, it's, uh, it's quite restricting when it does inflate. And so it's uh, an important thing to, uh, to uh, address with your, uh, with your passengers. And, and I would really caution you guys to never, ever um, assume anybody knows anything. Um, lost a friend this winter who walked into a propeller and uh, I just never would have imagined. I mean, this, this man had more experience and more knowledge than I will probably ever have in my life. And it's just an absolute tragedy that came from just one inadvertent moment that, uh, of inattention. And that, that, that big whirling fan out in the front is an awful danger. So, so again, you know, it's not isolated to just cracking up and getting upside down like that. It's, uh, it's, you know, remembering that, uh, that the aircraft is, is a dangerous thing. Um, you know, the two most important things in aviation are, are energy management and situational awareness. And, uh, there's never a safe time around that aircraft. You can, you can walk into the back of a, uh, of a sharp Cessna 172 wing and cut your, your forehead to the bone. There's, there's not a safe thing about these aircraft if we are inattentive and, and not, and not cautious. And so I, uh, I would just caution people to, uh, to, uh, really spend a lot of time in their pre-flight briefs, spend a lot of time telling the people the inherent dangers of aviation and, and, uh, and have them help you out, you know, have, uh, have all eyes outside looking for traffic and, and, uh, don't, don't, uh, you know, just assume that the pilot knows about air traffic that's in his area or her area. Make sure that, uh, that everybody shouts out if they see another airplane. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the pre-flight inspection for uh, float planes is obviously a uh, extremely important thing to do. This is a couple thing, uh, uh, this is an item that popped up a couple times on me last year where um, um, in the pre-flight operations of pumping floats had a, uh, had a couple of, uh, of uh, students that uh, you know, just bragged that you know this this chamber here, for example, is never I've never pumped any any uh, water out of this uh, this particular bulkhead, and and whenever that happens, then first thing I do will I, I'll take the pump, the bilge pump, and I'll suck up a little bit of water, and I'll put right down the opening of the uh, of the uh, bilge pump opening there, and then I'll I'll give a several pulls and make and see if any water comes out, and uh, and also listen for that telltale sound, sign, it's that that sound that if you give several good pumps on that, uh, on that bilge pump, you're going to hear that hissing, sucking sound as the air returns back into the chamber. And, um, and sure enough, two times this, uh, very recently, we didn't have that sound. And uh, as you can see in the graphic there, it's a very simple thing that, that hose end just comes off. And, um, and so the, uh, float allows to, uh, you know, the, uh, the water just is not sucked out when you're doing your pre-flight and, uh, you're doing your job, but it's not doing it. So, so if that's something that uh, you suspect, you know, it's time to take a screwdriver and take off those, uh, those handhold covers and, and inspect it by hand and see. And it's uh, not a terribly uh, uh, complicated operation putting those hoses on. You can just, uh, you, can, uh, you know, have your, uh, have your mechanic put that back on. And, and, uh, and I, I, I won't, you know, tell you to do it yourself because that, that's one of the things I'm not sure. I know we have, uh, you know, a number of things we can do with our own aircraft, but uh, without the without the laws in front of me, I won't say to do it yourself. So have a, have a mechanic. I'll just I'll protect myself and say have a mechanic do that for you. But uh, the pre-flight inspection should be, you know, the same that you're, as you're doing on your land aircraft, but um, paying special attention to, uh, to the other things that can happen with the aircraft. You know, these things are, are an incredible bug house. And so uh, I, I've had some uh, pilots get awfully distracted by a great big old spider that comes down on a web in front of their, uh, in front of their nose on takeoff. And, and, uh, you know, people with some pretty good arachnophobia can get awfully distracted by that. So, so it's not a bad idea to bring a shop back or something once in a while and start hitting those airplanes. We have incredible bug infestations that can get into every part of the aircraft. So, you know, check your pitot tubes, check your static ports, check, 
check areas that can get plugged. Um, huge bird environment, you know, when we're, when we're tied up on these lakes, we have an incredible amount of nesting wildlife there. So, so watch the aircraft if you're not flying real regularly. And if, even if you are, watch out for birds that are, that are nesting and building nests in all sorts of places. I uh, flew with a gentleman with a tailor craft a few years ago, and he had a, a a tailor craft wing that was uh, one of the largest squirrel nests I've ever seen. I don't know how big the family of squirrels was that lived in this thing, but, uh, but uh, the uh, pre-flight inspection should be uh, very inclusive. Watch for uh, water in your fuel. Very, very common thing. Watch for, uh, you know, any of the, uh, um, any of the things that can, uh, you know, crop up in a, in a normal pre-flight, but uh, are hard to look at on a, on a uh, pre-flight inspection on a float plane. So next slide, please. Um, a lot of people, oops, back one. A lot of people last year, you know, were asking about the, uh, you know, as, as we learn about these things, we're cautioned about certain things, but we never really endeavor into them and, and have experienced them. But, you know, the, uh, the downwind to upwind turn, this is uh, caution to us in our training as one of the most dangerous things that we'll do in, uh, in float flying. And that's the scenario is we are, we are step taxiing, you know, with the wind at our back, and then we make a turn and go into the wind. And as you can see in the graphic, you know, the resultant forces, we've got a, uh, a uh, uh, inertial force, and then we've got the wind force on there also. And uh, even though we may have, and we should have all of, in this case, all the left aileron deflected, we'd be turning into that wind. There's still enough uh, energy that can get that aircraft uh, tipped up. And once we get a little wind under that wing like that, it's gonna result in a capsize and, and it's uh, gonna be at a high speed too. So it's gonna be a, a terribly abrupt thing that's going to uh, to uh, uh, most likely end up in an inverted aircraft. Um, happened to a good friend of mine up at Chena Marina, and uh, and is a, a terrible way to start a flight. So uh, again, the, um, you know that there's an awful lot of, uh, of training that's done with step turns, but I think we all know in the reality of it, there's not a lot of step turns that are really necessary that often. I, um, as I mentioned before. Landing at Lake Hood <clears throat> with a hard southeast in the afternoon, I would usually land, um, and the Beaver's a heavy airplane, so it, it handles those crosswinds real well, but I'd land up in Lake Hood, you know, and request the channel option, and then stay on step, and then uh, use a good crosswind technique and land long down the channel, and then uh, and use a crosswind to stay on step uh, all the way down to my, uh, to uh, where we moor and where we tie up there. <clears throat> but, um, but in reality, you know, and uh, a lot of times we're just normally saving time with long straight um, step work. We don't have to do a lot of tight turns and, and rarely, I mean, do we ever have to really do a, a 180 as we're, you know, and, and most of us got trained that in our, in our initial training. And, um, but if you do that, you know, just be aware of the, the amount of, of wind that your airplane can hand, uh, handle. You know, it's, it's, when you start getting past six, eight knots, you know, in most aircraft, that's getting pretty significant. And, uh, you know, when we start seeing the white cat scratches and, and um, start seeing the winds start to build up past seven, eight, nine knots, it's, it's going to be, uh, you know, more and more dangerous for our really light aircraft. And, and aircraft are getting lighter and lighter. The experimental stuff and the, uh, the carbon cubs and, and the uh, real lightweight cubs, are, they're, uh, they're pretty susceptible to this, uh, to this scenario that uh, they can get a little bit of wind under that wing pretty easy. And so, so do watch out for that. And, and, and again, it's a great place for some additional training. There's some Phenomenal trainers here in town, and, and uh, you know I can I can give you the names of, of half a dozen that are that are very very accomplished float plane pilots, and and so spend some time you know before you go out and just tear into some of these turns and start seeing how much you can do. You know it's a, a very good idea to get some good training in it. So next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, the crosswind takeoff. One thing you know it's even in our in our acronym. I, I like to use F cars. Um, so, you know, we've done the, we've done the pre-flight, uh, um, uh, checks and, and we've gotten uh, clearance for takeoff, everything else like that, or maybe we're just out on a lake and ready to go. Um, the F cars, uh, checklist is a pretty good one for most of our aircraft. So we, we set flaps for takeoff, um, carburetor heat is cold, area clear, the, uh, radio call has been made, the water rudders are up and, uh, and our stick will be back for takeoff. And, um, and a lot of students, you know, are just take that as 
absolute gospel that we we never have uh, water rudders down in any other situation. But but again, if if you've operated off of out of uh, Spinard, you know, if we're using a west route, for example, and and um, and you're going to have to use that channel, and you've got a pretty good crosswind in the afternoon, um, it's perfectly acceptable, and even in the training manuals, to leave water rudders down for takeoff. And uh, and I'm, I'm sure every accomplished float plane pilot knows, you know, the greatest danger of leaving water rudders down for uh, for your operations, and that that's of course that you're buying beer for the first person that that catches you. And so if you get seen with your water rudders down for takeoff or landing, you're, you're obviously going to uh, gonna be susceptible to the, uh, the, uh, the old, the old uh, case of beer uh, challenge there. So, but as you can see in the, uh, in the graphic here, um, I think Jay Fry wrote this one, where leaving the uh, water rudders down, and, and I found this it really works well in 180s, 185s. It's got that longer arm that, uh, that has a pretty good, uh, pretty good amount of, uh, of uh, control force on that tail where, where that, that nose is pretty hard to hold if we don't use a little bit of water on these takeoff runs. And, and, um, and uh, I was flying with someone last year and, and I noticed that on all of their takeoff runs, they would start pulling up the water rudders about, um, about in the hump phase. So as, as the aircraft was transitioning out of the plow up through the hump into the planing phase, they would, they would start pulling up their, uh, their water rudders there. And I was kind of intrigued by that because I like to watch what people do and, and learn from them. And I, I said, why are you doing that? And the, the student said, well, it, it's a lot easier to pull the water rudders up. And I thought, hmm. And, and, uh, and so I, I tried that. And, uh, and he was indeed right. It's uh, that, that force on the uh, water rudders makes it a lot easier to pull those, those cables when you're, uh, when you're going forward with some, with some takeoff speed. Um, you know, that being said, you know, in, in normal conditions, raise them for takeoff make sure they're up for landing because, uh, you know, they're going to bounce. They're going to, they're going to, you know, if you, if you're in shallow water, they're going to hit if, if there's something down there. So, so that's the prescribed method for training, but, uh, but it's, uh, again, something that can be used for a, uh, for a crosswind takeoff. So yeah, next slide, please. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, the, uh, the glassy is, uh, Pretty standard fare whenever we're doing any training. If, if we're doing a biennial flight review or, or um, obviously in the initial training, this is, is one of the things that your examiner is going to look at the hardest. And um, as you commercial pilots know, this is one thing the, uh, the 135 examiner is going to look at awfully hard is the, uh, is the setup and the completion of a, uh, of a glassy water landing. And, um, you know, that being said, the, the point of the glassy water landing is to find the water when you don't know where it is. And when I first started flying floats, I, I thought, well, that's pure nonsense. You can't tell me that I can't see where the water is. But I have, I have and I'm sure every float instructor and I'm sure everybody who's spent time in a uh, float plane has experienced, I've, I've had people flare me 300 feet above the water and thinking that water was 10 feet below them. And, and that's how insidious that glassy water is. And so, uh, so a, a, a good training setup for this is, uh, is to establish a, a, a sink rate with your aircraft that's going to give you 150 foot per minute. Um, in a standard Cessna, usually two notches of flaps is, is sufficient for this. In, in a Cub, if you're a, if you're a two notch guy, then you're usually one notch of flaps for this. And in, in, in both aircraft, after you've you know, cleaned up the prop on a 206 or if you're on a flat prop, about 1500 RPMs is, is usually about the right power setting. It's a power on stabilized descent all the way to the water. And use whatever visual reference you can find. If you have a, uh, a shoreline, that's one of the very best. If you, can, if you can come across a shoreline as close as physically possible, and I mean almost drag your water rudders in the weeds, that's a great place to then set your optimum planing angle and wait for the water to touch you. And um, when that water is really glassy, it has incredible adhesion energy. It, it's amazing how hard the airplane sticks to it. So, so that's where we really want to use a, a good smooth transition as we come to the water. So we, we pull the power and then smoothly pull back on the, uh, on the uh, stick or on the yoke to, uh, to come back into the, into the plow and, and into the uh, full displacement. Because pulling too fast will skip us, which you know, usually isn't a big deal. We know where the water's at now once we've skipped. But, uh, but it's nicest if you can do it in one smooth, continuous motion. And, and uh, I was out with a, uh, a gentleman here just, oh, last month. And uh, 
we were out on a, on a very calm evening and uh, he did two or three landings where it, it totally surprised me when we touched the water. I, I still thought we were 10 feet above the water. He was using the method and using the shoreline and, and, you know, in the back seat of a cub, I, I see the bald spot is about all I see. So I don't see, uh, see forward very well. And, and, uh, he'd done a very nice job. He, uh, he touched that water and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, just accomplish the uh, the maneuver perfectly by using um, in that aircraft about you know one notch of flaps in his cub and and uh, and a uh, constant power setting of about fifteen hundred and that that power setting is going to be dynamic it'll it'll vary with your weight also it might be thirteen if you're all alone it might be eighteen if you're full of moose meat so so it's something you'll have to practice with to to get it down but uh, you know the glassy water technique it, it's not really necessary if you really know where the water's at so if you if you are landing in the channel at Lake Hood, you know, it, it's, it's really not necessary that much, except for the, again, the adhesion to that uh, very glassy water that you're uh, contacting. And, um, and that glassy water has a strange negative energy. If you, you, you guys that have taken off from glassy water, when you turn back, is it a, it's always astonishing how fast your waves disappear. That, that glassy water sucks the life out of those waves just very, very quickly. So, you know, Conversely, when we're taking off on glassy water and we maybe go out and do some step turn figure eights to take off, man, you have to, you have to be pretty quick or, or your waves disappear pretty quickly in that, uh, in that scenario. So, next uh, slide, please. Rough water operations. Um, uh, again, something that uh, can be absolutely terrifying the, the first time you, uh, you encounter these. So it's something that's, that's good when the wind gets howling you know, get with your instructor and get into some of the bigger water and some of the big deep water where you can start seeing some bigger, bigger waves. And, you know, as long as they're, they're legal size and you're not going to hurt yourself, that's some awfully good training. Um, good rough water uh, technique is, is usually full flaps. And uh, in, in a fixed bridge pr propeller airplane, I'm usually about 1300 RPMs landing way back on the heels. And as soon as you contact, pull all the power, pull the stick all the way back. And then, uh, get to where you have to go. Um, hopefully it's not a long ways and hopefully you, you don't have a lot of uh, turning to do because in, obviously in water this big as in the graphic you see there, it's gonna be pretty impossible to even do a plow turn in that. You're, you're gonna be relegated to, to lifting those water rudders up and, and, um, and sailing back to where you're going because it's uh, turning around is gonna be pretty impossible and, and pretty dangerous too. It even, you know, it, it doesn't have to be just in a energy induced uh, step turn up on step to get flipped over you, you if you got your your wing sideways in that and, and got a little bit of wind under there that's that's enough to get you flipped over too so so rough water operations i know i'm talking pretty briefly about these elements right here because uh you know this is just something that you you need to go practice with and and uh you know unfortunately you could you could use the excuse i'm never going to get caught in it and i would never deal with it and, and that'd be wonderful but you know it's just it's just never never the case we we come back and, and uh, you know, it, it, it'd be a great idea to just go land at another lake and spend the night if you could, but you know, you might be getting into fuel reserves too. So there's a, a lot of reasons to, to keep your training up so that you can, you can deal with these unexpected winds when they come up. And uh, some of these lakes get some giant waves. Boy, I've, I've, seen, I've seen waves 12, 15 feet down in Iliamna and, and you're not landing in that. That's, then you're going to East Wind or you're going to the bucket. You're not gonna Pike Lake, you're not gonna land up in Iliamna when they, when, when the waves get that big. So next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> All right. So that's kind of the, the, uh, um, some of the meat and potatoes that we, we talked about last year and people came up and asked me about last year. And, uh, as I mentioned before, I, uh, I, uh, had, I think one day off last summer and, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. I flew for a, an operator off Lake Hood and, and, uh, again, and, and, uh, and did honestly work, I think every day, but one, and um, and so just thought I'd I'd highlight and tell some of the fun stuff we're doing out there. And uh, in in this uh, photo here, the uh, on the uh, orange sled there is a moose calf that's all trussed up and tranquilized. And so um, we uh, we took these calves. There's a, a, a lady, I think she's a veterinarian here in town, but she has a, a operation called Moose Mamas, and she uh, takes these orphan moose calves and raises them up to about 250 300 pounds, and then uh, tranquilizes them and and uh, and we haul them out and and uh, every day I would of course call in the boss and see what I'm doing and he said I was hauling moose and I said what's well, not moose season he goes well you'll see and and when I got there here's a horse trailer with a couple of moose calves and so I called the family and my daughter got to 
pet a moose and she thought that was pretty cool and so so we held these things down to Calgon Island and and uh, and so they're uh, 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 diversifying the genetics a little bit down there. It's a pretty good population of moose down in Calgon, but uh, got a few more now there that we took in. So that was fun. Next slide. The uh, summer last summer was was uh, very smoky, but my co-pilot's giving me trouble here. But uh, but we had some beautiful days up in Rainy Pass. Spent a lot of time with uh, Rainy Pass Lodge and with Stefan Lake Lodge and. and uh, Oh, we got onto Prince William Sound into the ocean a little bit, and and so uh, I, I don't get pictures of me. I take a lot of pictures out the uh, window, but I don't get pictures of me very often. But a, uh, a tourist took this picture of us landing there, and, and uh, this uh, this beautiful airplane. The airplane belongs to Keenan Zirkel, and uh, and it's just about one of the prettiest things I've ever seen. It's got just the most kind of a Harley Davidson theme on there. It's orange and gray and black, and and just a beautiful airplane. So um, you know, this is kind of the uh, the uh, reason we all fly is that picture in our head. That's, that's the picture that was in my head from the time I was three years old and wanted to come to Alaska and fly float planes. And, and it's pretty cool. You know, we, we, we live in a place where, where if you have a dream and, and you have some motivation and, and uh, you put a whole bunch of money into it, you can, uh, you can get into a situation where you can uh, do some awfully cool things. But uh, this is Puntilla Lake at uh, one of my favorite places in the world, Rainy Pass Lodge. Next slide. Um, flying for a carrier, it's, it's an interesting thing. You know, you're hauling tourists, you're hauling, uh, hauling hunters and fishermen, but this was an interesting operation. We uh, went down to Little Lake Clark and, uh, and rescued the widgeon there. In fact, that's Keenan Zirkle up on the wing of that, uh, widgeon. The, uh, the widgeon had gone up onto the, uh, uh, to visit a friend up at a cabin there, dropped his wheels. And this, uh, this was some of the strangest, uh, surface I've ever seen that it was almost like Cook Inlet mud mixed with potter's clay. It was the stickiest stuff I, I think I've ever dealt with. And that poor widgeon got stuck absolutely tight as a tick. And we, we went down there and, uh, and Keenan had done this before. So he, uh, he brought a, a gold miner's dredge or some sort of high power water dredge there and, and a fire hose and, and blasted the, the mud out from under this airplane and got him going. And then, then treated us to burgers over at uh, Port Allsworth at the uh, cool little diner. If you haven't been down there, that's a, a fun little diner car down in uh, Port Allsworth. It's just a, uh, walking distance from uh, from the bay there so just a spectacular day and and uh kind of kind of crazy they uh, they pay you to do this kind of thing so it's a pretty fun day so next slide up at crescent lake looking at bears i think the family is probably from dallas or someplace like that and, and just a beautiful day beautiful airplane just a just a you know one of those places that most of the world never gets to see but but we float plane pilots it is just it's a key to a whole new world, and, and that's, that's why we do it. You know, I, I said last year I covered the safe and the legal aspects of aviation and of, of float plane flying, and I, people said, you know, you didn't talk much about the fun aspect. And I said, well, the, the fun aspect speaks for itself. And they said, well, we'd like to hear more about that too. So I, I threw some of these slides in here this year because it, it's just, you know, it, it, there are those days when you just, you really have to just pinch yourself. You can't believe it. I mean, you're, you're flying the airplane you wanted to fly since you were a little kid, and you're, you're uh, you're getting to take people in who've got eyes as big as pie plates seeing bears. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a thing. You know, a lot of people don't like tourists, but I, I get the biggest kick out of them. It, it's like seeing it my, myself for the first time. So I, I really enjoy it. So next slide, please. Again, my, one of my favorite places, we did a, oh, nearly daily operations up to Rainy Pass and, and would take uh, people on horseback rides up there. And, and so uh, you'll get quite a, uh, quite a uh, uh, convoy in some cases. There, uh, there were airplanes from all over the place and, and people just, you know, from every walks of life, from the, from the kid that can barely afford it to the, to the, you know, people that can more than afford it, but we're all in it for the same reason. Everybody's sharing stories and, and it's just a, a spectacular thing. And so the, these are some awfully fun places to go there. If, you, if you've never met the parents family before out at Rainy Pass, they are, they are just about some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. And so I would highly encourage you to stop up there and, and have a cup of coffee and, and meet, uh, meet some of the folks. The, uh, the first cabin that you see over there is, uh, is the cab, uh, cabin that you own, belongs to the uh, Alaska's oldest master guide, Bucky Winkley. And, and he is, he's a true living legend. He's got a, 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 um, a museum in there that, that is really, really something. You need to go up there and see his museum. So, so if you're looking for fun places to fly, this is, this is high on my list. This is a, a really fun place to go. So. Next uh, slide, please. 
Um, in, in finishing up here, as, as I said last year, you know, the, the, the thing we really have to do, we've got to be ambassadors for our craft and we have to fly safe. You know, we have to, uh, we have to, uh, you know, talk about, um, you know, the, the things that could happen and then, and then try to avoid them. I, I've always used the acronym SAFE for my students. And the, the S stands for self. Before you go flying, evaluate yourself. Are you feeling good? Are you mentally up to it? Have you gotten in a fight with your boss, your wife, or your husband? I mean, uh, make sure that your head's in the game. Don't go flying when you're distracted. Don't go flying when there's, there's anything wrong with you. Don't go flying if you've popped a couple Sudafed and you're, you're having allergy problems. You know, if you, if you don't know what uh, medications are safe to fly with, call your flight surgeon and ask that person and, and, uh, and know, you know, when it's a good time to fly for yourself. Um, evaluate your aircraft, you know, make sure that your aircraft is operating properly. Don't, uh, don't fly an aircraft that isn't, uh, that doesn't look, feel, and, and, you know, I just got, a uh, this month's, uh, AOPA and, uh, again, my, my good friend and master aviator, uh, Vern Kingsford is quoted in here and um, uh, talked about, does the aircraft look right? Does it check out? Well, in, in this case, there's a story of a, a mall that uh, had a, a seal go out on the prop and lost all but a quart of oil. And, uh, and Vern is quoted here as saying, and I, I've heard him say this many times, um, the author says, I quote Vern Kingsford of Alaska Float Ratings, who paraphrased Greek uh, poet uh, Archilochos, when emergency when emergencies occur, we don't rise to the occasion. We rise to the level of our training and experience. And, uh, and so that's, that's, you know, very sage advice from a, from a very experienced aviator. Spend time with those guys and, and talk to them. But, but uh, evaluate the aircraft. Does it look, feel, and smell right, you know? Um, the F stands for flight. Evaluate your flight. You know, do you know this flight? Have you been on this route before? Have you been through this pass? Um, yeah, awful good idea to take somebody who's been through that pass with you for the first time if you've never been there. And, and the last thing, of course, is our greatest danger. It's our number one killer, and that's the environment. Um, please, please promise me and promise your loved ones and promise yourself you will not continue forward into IMC conditions. It, it, is, not, it is not a place for our, our general aviation aircraft. I don't care what kind of Buck Rogers, whiz bang, synthetic vision you've got. I don't care what you've got in that airplane. You, you are not legal. You're not safe, and you're not going to be having fun if you're if you're venturing forward into those IMC conditions. You you do not have to go. You can turn around and you can land on that little lake behind you. You can keep some survival gear. You can go back home, but but don't go forward. We we've all lost a number of friends that have have made that terrible decision, and so it, it's very important that we uh, that we uh, remember the uh, incredible safe uh, uh, the incredible. Uh, you know, responsibility we have here because we're representing a community and, and people already have a, a poor image of us as, as pilots, you know, small airplanes, they're not safe, they're dangerous, you know, don't ever get in a small airplane. It, you know, and it's it just, it doesn't have to be true. I mean, this can be a, a lifelong obsession and passion that you can, that you can nurture and grow and, and grow in others. And, and, and it's something we need to, because, uh, you know, with this, with this COVID thing now, I mean, we're, we're going to be, seeing some really dire times for, for all carriers at all, at all levels. And like I said, the schools are doing really well right now, but uh, that, that worries me too. I think, uh, you know, these kids are going to see that, uh, you know, these job opportunities are not going to be there like they were six months ago. And that, that worries me that we're going to see an industry collapse on both ends, you know, from the, from the top side and the bottom side. And, and it, it's going to be a sad thing. So, you know, we, we need to promote this and we need to stay safe and, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. And if you have great advice, share it with somebody and and uh and please you know we pilots are an are a arrogant bunch we don't like being told what to do but when somebody gives you good advice please listen um i had uh i had four incidences in the last two months of of people coming into patterns oh at wasilla and birchwood backwards backwards uh goose bay wrong frequency backwards and uh and know what you're doing out there make sure you're on the right frequency make sure you're talking using the proper protocol and um and make sure you're uh you're looking, listening, putting your lights on, you know, those LEDs, there's no reason to shut them off. Keep those things burning in the air. They're, they're a great way to keep them running into other aircraft. And, and just being a long ways from other pilots, you know, it, it's not a great way of uh, avoiding them either. I mean, here we are in, in a remote area over a glacier. I probably saw five airplanes within two miles of me that day. So, so again, not often I get pictures taken of me, but our, our other ship was on the water with the tourists and somebody took a picture of me that one. So, so it's kind of fun to get a picture. So. Uh, last slide, please. 
again, I really like to uh, um, um, promote aviation as a uh, as a uh, educator. Thirty years public school uh, teacher in, in Anchorage, and and a uh, teaching a uh, Part One Forty One ground school to high school kids. Um, promoting aviation to young people is is obviously you know an amazing thing, but it is a it is an incredible incredible um, uh, honor to send these young people on on their way. This is this is my twelve year old here, Sophie, on her first flight lesson. So we uh, we flew up to uh, um, the valley and and uh, she went through the four forces and and learned the learned uh, the basics of aviation. And, and uh, I have four kids. One of us is, a, is an A and P uh, uh, mechanic. The other one is a uh, is a uh, officer of the law and and the third one is a uh, works at Lowe's and uh, and this one is probably going to be my pilot she's the only one that's really interested in aviation so she pesters me constantly but uh, but this was on her first lesson and and uh, and you can see by the smile um, that's the power we have to uh, to uh, generate out there you old pilots that have got these nice airplanes and you're not flying very often um, get involved with this Airmen's Association uh, Victoria can can tell you a whole bunch of people um, Aris Another great member of the uh, uh, of the organization can steer you towards some young people that would absolutely love to be your uh, your first officer on your flights and and take that airplane out and share this craft that you've been honing for a generation and find some young people because it's incredibly important. I mean, it's important that we fly these airplanes for a living, but I think it's much more important that we fly these these airplanes for love and for passion because this is this is what makes life worth living right here. So. Folks, I hope uh, I hope that was a uh, uh, not too long. Oh, I talked almost as long as I did last year. I apologize. So I uh, hope you gleaned a little bit out of that. If if uh, there's time for questions, I don't know how how we're working that. Victoria will will help us with that. But it was a pleasure talking to you guys again. Um, hopefully next year we can do this in person and uh, and we can uh, and shake hands and and uh, and uh, get, get get back to life as normal. So keep flying safe out there, folks. As I tell all my students, and, and I consider you to be my students, help and questions are always free 24-7. If you need help, I got a keychain full of keys from different students to give me their airplanes, and I, I'll come help you if you get in trouble. So it would be, be my honor. So. All right. Well, thank you, Dean. Um, let me see. I can unmute everyone, and we can do a let me see, question and answer type thing. You can unmute and then if you want to stay on mute, you can mute yourself, um, but it's just easier for me. We have 73 people, so I can't individually unmute everyone. It is, it is. It should, that's Un exactly. Everybody, and then. No, I don't think so. I think Megan missed it, but there was only one opportunity from 36 to 40 weeks to find it. Megan will let well, her. There we go, okay. Um, so if anybody has an individual question for Dean, feel free to ask it. Um, I know that we did get one in the chat from John Maloney, who was uh, interested and looks like Stacy answered it. But Dean, I don't know if you have an opinion on uh, what's the forecasted or estimated demand for commercial float plane pilots in Alaska for the years ahead and which uh, float planes are the majority of that demand? <clears throat> You know, I, I guess um, um, being an old geezer, I'm, I'm officially 55, so I'm a senior citizen now, so I'm really working that. And uh, as a teacher of, of young people, high school kids, um, I, uh, I really told them all the time that, that, you know, we've screwed up a lot of stuff, and you guys are my greatest hope for this generation. So, so you know, this, this COVID thing has, has affected a lot of things, and, and it's a scary thing, I will say that too. But it, it's it's really affected our our aviation, uh, uh, our our business and our lifestyle and everything else like that. And so, you know, it it's a it's a risky operation this flying thing. And I I've been instructing. I haven't missed a day. I've been sitting next to people every single day, and uh, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm willing to take that risk because uh, you know it, it's the demand is out there for for aviation and and people want to learn to fly. And so I'm I'm continuing to to do that. And so it, it all hinges on that. You know, I, I think we uh, we need to start thinking about, you know, are we willing to shut down our lives and not live at all so that we can uh, be safe? And, and I'll tell you right now, I mean, that's not possible. I, I was just about run over by a drunk driver two nights ago. I had a guy come peeling through a quiet neighborhood and he was four sheets to the wind. And, and uh, 
I got his license plate and reported him and the, and the cops got him not long afterwards. But I mean, you know, here I am trying to be safe and I, I just about got nailed right there. So, you mm-hmm. know, we're, we're trying to protect ourselves from a virus and, you know, hopefully that's not going to keep us from living. And, and uh, that's, that's just my own personal opinion. I know people have all kinds of opinions on that, but uh, I would, I would really like to see us getting back into these airplanes and, and uh, getting back into the airlines, getting back into these uh, part 135s. And, you know, and if, if we can do that, then the demand is, is unbelievable. Last summer, you know, you could not find pilots to fly uh, part 135. There was such a great demand that, that uh, anybody who learned a job flying floats. Um, the aircraft, you know, the aircraft are, are going to be Super Cubs, 206s, Beavers, you know, and, and you're, you're just going to be amazed at, at, I mean, there's some carriers that have put some people into these airplanes with some pretty low hours, and, and it doesn't mean that they're bad pilots or inexperienced. It means that they're very good pilots. And, and uh, you know, we, we remember that, you know, in World War II, we had, we had young women that were delivering every one of our fighter and bomber aircraft to the, uh, to the European theater that probably had two, 300 hours. And they were taking those aircraft and giving them to fighter pilots that had 175 hours and started shooting down other other aircraft in a in a World War II situation. And so, you know, not having a lot of experience doesn't mean there are not jobs out there for you. Also, there there are some there were some tremendous opportunities. So, I certainly hope that comes back. I, I would love to say that it's going to recover and next summer is going to be normal, but you know, who knows? I just uh, uh, for me, you know, the instruction has been very busy. Um, you know, and, and if you're getting a commercial license, folks, I would really, really encourage you to get into instruction. I, I never wanted to be a flight instructor, but man, has it been an incredible blessing. I, I've met the best friends I've ever made. I've flown every airplane you can possibly imagine. I mean, it is every, every single engine aircraft that you can, that you can name, I've, I've been in it. it it's, it's really a fun job. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't go into it blindly. I'll read the manuals. I'll talk to people. I'll, I'll get training if, if I can, but, um, but it's a, it's a fun thing. So, you know, don't let any, any barriers in the industry stop you. If that's something you got to do, you're going to do it. I mean, that, that was, that was mine too. I, I, I had to be there. I was a dumb farm boy from North Dakota and I got to Alaska as quick as, as I could after high school. And, and here I am. So if I can do it, that's, I always told my students, if I can do it, anybody can. So. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, we have another question here from Stacy, um, and she is asking, "How do you inspect the bottoms of floats, or is there a way?" That, that that's an excellent question. You know, I mean, um, short of putting on a, a snorkel and scuba gear and going under a float, that's that's a pretty tough inspect. Um, obviously, excessive water leakage in a, in a compartment is going to mean you've got some damage somewhere. So that's usually going to be on the bottom of floats and, and they're pretty easy to pop. I mean, we've, we've hit rocks with them and we've, we've reached entire um, um, bulkheads. And so, so, you know, it, when, when those, uh, when those things are hitting sharp, sharp objects, there's a good chance. And the, and the best telltale sign is that you're going to pick up additional water in that, uh, in that hatch. So if you're pumping a lot of water real often, that's one of the best ways to do it. After that, you know, take it to Lake Hood and talk to Ski or Star or one of those guys over there and have them come over with a float picker and, and pick you out of the water and, and you can take a look at them that way and, and then they can start to start taking a look at your floats also. So, All right. Um, so Eugene is asking, is there a technology available to prevent the amphibian pilot to remember to pull their gear up before landing on the water? Um, I've got a, a couple of uh, students that have brand new 206s and it's got a, a very strange voice. I don't know if you've heard this before, but I think it's a 2014, 2015 model. And uh, as we were landing at Lake Hood, uh, the airplane said, wheels down for, uh, for land operations or something like that. I had this strange gravelly voice and then had a completely different voice, wheels up for water. And so, uh, I think it must have been using GPS to tell that we were lined up for a for a gravel runway, and uh, and uh, it would give us an audio on the uh, had the G1000s on uh, glass panel on the air, on a 206, and so yes, it, that was uh, that was actually on that aircraft. So that was, that was pretty interesting. <laughs> oh wow, that's pretty cool. All right, and then um, so we have some people that are interested in getting your email address for questions later after the fact. Um, Absolutely. So if you want. Um, you can probably just put 
put it in the chat feature, honestly, that would probably be easiest way to hand that out. Um, or if you just want to say it real quick so people can jot it down, but. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my email is Dean S Paulson one at gmail.com. And Paulson is P A U L S O N Dean S Paulson one at gmail.com. All right. And then I will also put it in the chat for everybody. Um, all right. Well, yeah, that looks like that's all the questions in the chat feature. We are all done for tonight. Um, I will go ahead and put his email address out there for everybody. And we thank you very much, Dean, for doing this for us again. You're welcome. It's a pleasure any, anytime. So thank you very much. Awesome. All right. Everybody have a good night. Thank you for coming. Good night.